hours later having not cleaned her room but having memorized it. Um, and we can, we can laugh if we want, uh, but when it comes to, to making disciples and when it comes to what he had to say, he's talking about us directly. Because when it comes to making disciples, we have failed as a whole. Um, and I know that we have failed for sure. A lot of what we preach on up here is very internal. If I were to do a sermon on pride and talk about why it's bad to be prideful, it would be very easy to, to lie and pretend and hide behind the fact that we weren't doing that um, because no one would be able to see that sign. Mike preached last week on, on communion and our attitude behind communion. He did a great job. And he talked about having joy in our hearts rather than sorrow when we take the Lord's Supper. And I thought it was much needed. But here's the thing. I, I can't tell based on looking at you guys doing the Lord's Supper what's in your heart and what's in your attitude. It's hard to tell. But when it comes to, to making disciples, it's clear to see. It's physical. It's tangible. I can tell that we have failed and we can't hide behind it. Because I look out from up here often, not every Sunday, but I'm up here a lot, and I see the same number of people every time. How many people do we have here today? 100, 120? Somewhere in that range. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having 100 people in church on Sunday morning, assuming last year you had 50 people. But we've been stagnant. We haven't been growing. And so when I say that we have failed in making disciples, we can pretend that we do a good job. We can, we can try and hide behind that. But if we were to do that, we'd be like the chubby kid playing hide and seek, trying to hide behind the tree and his belly sticking out. And it's like, dude, like we know that you're right there. You're not like fooling anyone. So right up front, right off the start, when talking about making disciples, I just wanted to be, be aware of the fact that this is something we need to hear. This is something we need to do because we're stagnant and we haven't been growing. Um, so... I think some of us has, have maybe misdiagnosed this problem of why we're not growing. Um, maybe we think, you know, it's, it's problems with leadership or, or worship or the sermons aren't good enough. And maybe we've therefore misdiagnosed the solution saying, well, now that we have the steering committee in place, things are going to be good. Um, and we can get, now that Glenn Newton is coming and the sermons are going to be good, we're going to grow as a church and, and things are going to be good. But... That's not the real issue. The real problem is that each and every one of us here aren't doing everything we can to make, dis make disciples in our lives. And the, the real solution is really, really actually pretty simple. It's not that complicated. It's each and every one of us here doing everything we can in our everyday lives to go and make disciples. And I think that's really, really important um, because like we talked about, that's how the church grows. But I also think there are some other, hit the wrong button, other consequences uh, positive consequences when we as a church commit to making disciples. And that's where you'll see the longest sermon title probably in the history of Mandarin of how to grow the church, stop mass shootings, and solve all the world's problems in four simple steps. I'm going to come back to, to all of that um, at the end. But first, I want to, what, I, what this sermon is going to be is predominantly encouraging you guys to, to go actually try and do it to actually, in your lives, try and make disciples. But also, it's a bit of a how-to. Because when you look at, when you hear the phrase, go make disciples, it's kind of confusing. It raises a lot of questions. Where, how, who, what, what am I supposed to do? But when we look at the Great Commission, which is really a commandment, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, the scripture reading, not only do we see the command to go make disciples, but it's actually laid out pretty simply how we supposed, we're supposed to do that. Now, simple doesn't mean easy, because it's very hard. But it's not very complicated. We just do what it says. And so we're going to look at the Great Commission. We're also going to look at how the disciples heard what Jesus said, and then they actually put it to practice and followed the model that is in Matthew chapter 28. So there's four basic steps uh, that, are, that are outlined in, in the text on how we, as Christians, go about making disciples. The first one is really obvious. In fact, it's so obvious, it's not directly in the text, but that's be a disciple yourselves. Now, if we were to read the Great Commission, Jesus doesn't say, all right, now here's how you make disciples. First, you have to be disciples, because he doesn't have to, because he's, but we know you have to, because that's who Jesus is talking to, uh, is a disciple. Now, it seems obvious, it seems like a waste of time, me saying this, but it is very significant, because the reason I'm saying this is because you will create what you are when it comes to reaching out. Whatever your attitude towards Jesus is 
whatever your attitude towards the church is, that's what you're going to produce in your outreach efforts. For example, if you are just a social churchgoer, if you come here because you like the people, you have a lot of friends here, and you want to get your friends connected, then that's exactly what you're going to create. You're going to create more social churchgoers who are only in it to make friends. If you're a legalistic Pharisee, in your effort to outreach, you're going to create more legalistic Pharisees. If you're here just because you feel good about yourself, like you're doing the right thing, and you're trying to get more people to come here, you're just going to create more people who, who come here to feel good about themselves. If you're here just f to get out of hell, to get the get out of hell free card, you're just going to create more people interested in getting the get out of hell free card. But if you are a true, authentic disciple of Jesus Christ, then what you're going to create through your outreach efforts is a disciple of Jesus Christ. So the obvious question is, what exactly is a disciple? Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but very briefly, the way discipleship worked uh, in, in the ancient world, the model that you know, Jesus was using, that other rabbis of the time were using, um, was, was a rabbi would, would have his disciple or, or disciples. Um, they would follow him around and shadow him. Um, and through, through shadowing him, they would learn his teachings. And then when that rabbi mo either retired or died, they would continue the work of the rabbi. So put simply, I really believe what a disciple is, is someone who follows Jesus, and in following Jesus, learns from Jesus, and then seeks, seeks to imitate. Um, pay, paying attention to Jesus, intentionally making an effort every day to, to follow him, whether that's through reading scripture, or through prayer, or through, through listening to what the Holy Spirit might have to say. And through that we learn, we soak in knowledge through this process about who Jesus is, what he tells us to do, what Jesus says about life, what Jesus says about the kingdom. And imitate, we simply act on it. We try as much as we can to be like Jesus. I really think that our Christian life here on this earth can be summed up in those three actions. Um, there's a lot we could expand. We could do a sermon on each one of those. Uh, but put simply... People who live this way, people who live as followers, learners, imitators of Jesus, they are going to create more followers and learners and imitators of Jesus because that's what they win people to. That's what they point, point people towards. So the first step of making disciples is quite simply be a disciple. Not a, not a social churchgoer, not a Pharisee, but be a, a disciple, a follower, a learner, an imitator of Christ. Now, the second step uh, of making a disciple we see when, when outlining the Great Commission, the first, I guess, kind of verb is, is to go. He says, therefore, go and make disciples. Um, now, when we hear the word go, what immediately comes to mind is like a very obvious intentional action right now. I'm going to go and make a disciple. Um, what, what we think of is like, like a mission trip. And this passage gets used a lot in conjunction with mission trips because we're going to go, we're going to focus everything on making a disciple, this one point. Uh, it's, when we hear go, we think intentional, specific events designed for this, this purpose, whether it's a mission trip, um, whether it's door knocking, whether it's a cookout at, at an apartment complex. When, when I hear go, what immediately comes to mind is get out there and go do it right now as kind of like part of your life. Like you go make disciples here, and then you'll do something else here and then here, but it's just like an aspect. Um, but what does it really mean to go and make disciples? When you look at the, the Greek verb here for go, uh, a lot of scholars and a lot of, a lot of dictionaries have it translated not necessarily as go, but as having gone, or, or more accurately, as you go. Now, the difference doesn't seem like much, but it is significant, because when you're saying as you go, instead of go. Cannot get that right. Okay. We're saying as you go, you're not saying I'm going to go do this one-time event or one-time experience and try to make disciples there. What you're saying is as I go about my business, as I go about my everyday life, I am constantly seeking to make disciples. And it's great because you don't have to, to, to plan anything. You can just take your everyday life from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed and make disciples by, by trying to make disciples doing what it is you're already doing with your day. You don't necessarily need to go on a mission trip. You don't necessarily need to set aside any time to do it. You can do it wherever you are in your immediate square, in your immediate circle of influence through the constant effort um, in, in the rhythms of everyday life at school, at work, at, at the restaurant, at, at soccer practice, even at home. Uh, the difference between go and as you go is as you go, make disciples as you go about, it becomes our lifestyle where we make disciples as we go about our business of everyday life. 
Now, the goes are very important, right? These mission trips, these, these cookouts we do. Um, any sort of intentional event designed to create disciples are very important, but the main reason they're so important is because they create opportunity for the as you go. They increase your square of influence so that you are exposed to different people who need to know Jesus. Um, now, I said at the beginning, we are going to look at this model, and we're also going to see how the early church in Acts, the original disciples, followed this model. And so one of the more, more famous uh, examples of the early Christians making disciples is right when Jesus ascends, and then in Acts chapter 2, we have the Pentecost which is where Peter preaches a sermon and 3,000 disciples are made just like that. And so the first verse in Acts chapter 2 says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now this is, this is significant because it, it kind of proves my point that, they, that you don't need to be doing anything intentional for, intentional for this purpose. When Pentecost came, this was something that they were going to do anyways. It was part of their yearly routine. They didn't need to, to plan something. They were going to be there no matter what because it was part of their culture. It was a part of their lives. They weren't on a mission trip. They weren't hosting any, any sort of event, any sort of outreach. They were just doing what it was they were going to do anyways. And then the opportunity arose for them to make disciples, and they make disciples. And see, sometimes I wonder if God looks down on, on our mission trips, on our events, and he thinks, yeah, that's great, but the attitude that you have there, you should have every single day. You should constantly be seeking to, to make disciples. What you do at Camry Green, you're supposed to do everywhere. You're supposed to do that at work. You're supposed to do that at school. So the, fir the second step, uh, the first step is, is make disciples. The second step is to go, or as you go about your business, make disciples. And the third step is, is baptize. This is the one that us in the Church of Christ are really good at. But when I, when I see this kind of outline, be a disciple, go, and then baptize here in Matthew, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my first reaction is, you know, if we're just looking at this text as, as the way to do it, my thought is, really? Like, just like that. Is that easy? We go... And we tell them about Jesus, and then they're baptized, and then, okay, it's simple. Um, so it seems like there should be like a little something in between um, going and baptizing. We don't just go, pick them up, dunk them in the water, and we're done. There's something that happens in the middle. And we, we can figure out what that is by looking at the example the disciples set in Acts 2. Um, in the middle of Peter's sermon, I'm not gonna, we're not going to look at the whole thing, we're going to look at the verse that seems to me to be the most significant when trying to figure out how we can make disciples. Um, Peter says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. So what did they do between go and, making, and baptizing? They were witnesses to the resurrection. That's kind of like step two and a half. It's, it's what you do between go and baptize. Now, we can look at this and say, well, yeah, the disciples could bear witness to the resurrection very easily because they actually saw Jesus before he, was, before he died. They watched him die, and then they saw him alive again three days later. But we can't really do that because we weren't there. But what I would say is we can all bear witness to the resurrection through what we've experienced and what we've seen in our lives and in the lives of others. If you are a Christian, in one way or another, you have experienced resurrection. You have experienced new life. You have gone from being dead in sin to being made alive in Christ. Now, this is what we share with others when we encourage them to follow Jesus. Um, the model that is, that is in place here is not one of theology, of explaining to them why it's so important. It's one of testimony, of personal experience, of, of bearing witness to what you've seen in your life. Um, not that the theology isn't important, but I think what people are looking for and what is most effective is seeing that it is real today, that Jesus is real and alive today. We say to those that we come across every day as we go about our business, we let them know, hey, I have been changed by Jesus. Here is list A, B, C, D, everything that Jesus has done in my life, and you have got to get on board with this. Now, it's not going to work every time, because in the end, what we see is that it's the decision of the one that we are trying to disciple. Um, but this is, this is how we do it. We, we share our testimony. And then the, our favorite, um, our favorite one step, which is, which is baptizing them. 
Like I said before, baptism is something that we're good at. It's something that we teach. It's something that we know is important. And it's always what, what's going to happen um, through, through our outreach events. But when we look at Acts 2, 37, 38, the part of this story where the baptism takes place, there is something that I think we can take away, something that we can learn. And I am going to read this whole text. It says, when the people heard this, when the people heard what, what Peter was sharing, the witness to the resurrection of Jesus, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And then everyone's favorite verse, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We remember Acts 2.38 very well, but we don't always remember Acts 2.37 which is the fact that their baptism um, and the, the fact that Peter told them they needed to be baptized was in response to them coming to Peter saying, we're cut to the heart, what do we need to do? And I think the point here is that baptism is not something as much as we may often try. It's not something we can force on anyone. Um, I, I've seen way too many teenagers baptized at, at summer camps um, and other events and they end up falling away because, because they didn't mean it. But they were, they were so pressured into it. And they said, you got to do it, you got to do it, you got to do it. And they did it. And then two years later, nothing has changed, nothing is different. We need, we need to remember that this isn't something we can, we can force on anyone and expect it to have any meaning or any significance whatsoever. When we're discipling someone, we have to bear witness to the resurrection to them over and over and over and over, just through the way you live your life. And at some point... You can talk about baptism, but at some point, they're going to have to come to you. They're going to have to say, what do I need to do? How do I get this resurrection that you have? And so, step one is be a disciple. Step two is go, or as you go about your business. Uh, and then we bear witness to the resurrection. And then we baptized. And then step four is we continue to teach them. We see this in the Great Commission as well. Um, it says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then the disciples in Acts 2 continue to follow this model, we see, where it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. So the disciples actually continue to follow this model and do what Jesus told them to do, which, which was teach them. And this is why, this mainly, more than anything else, is why discipleship, why making disciples is so hard and so challenging and something that we maybe tend to shy away from. Because when we disciple someone else, we have the responsibility to continue to be a mentoring presence in their lives. And that's the part that scares us. That's why we want to baptize them and just be done with them. Uh, because discipleship, discipleship, making disciples, is a job that we wish had an ending. But the reality is that the job never ends. And we all have a responsibility to continue to teach the ways of Jesus to the disciples that we have created. See, this is where it becomes really important that we are actually disciples ourselves and we are actually learners. Because then we can just regurgitate the information that we are already learning through following Jesus ourselves. And we don't have to come to, to a preacher or a teacher and say, you teach this person that I'm discipling. It is not my job or Mike's job or Troy's job to teach the people that you guys are discipling. We can't uh, be attentive to every need of every person that you guys are trying to make disciples of. Um, if, if any, I've never had this experience. I've never heard of this happening here, but I know it happens at a lot of churches where, where someone will say, come up to the preacher and say, there's this person I've been mentoring. There's this person I've been discipling, and this is something he really needs to learn. Will you preach on it? If you ever do that, shame on you. Because it is your job to teach that to them. And you clearly already know it if you're asking. Um, so it is, it is each of our job to continue to teach those that we disciple. And the job never ends. We keep teaching them. We continue to grow with them. We continue to mentor them. And while the job never ends, it does begin again with someone new as we continue to make disciples as we go. Um, so the kind of the last, last stage would be to repeat the process. So when, when Peter and the apostles in Acts 2 made disciples, what do you guys think? Do you think they stopped or do you think they repeated? I think they did it again because in Acts 2.47 it says, The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This verse has always jumped off the pages to me as something that is absolutely insane and borderline unrealistic. And when I read that, I think, can 
the Lord add to our number at Mandarin daily those who are being saved? And my gut tells me no. But when I really think about it, if every single person in this room was actively trying to make disciples out of the people that they encountered on an everyday basis, is it really that crazy to think that the Lord could add to our number daily? I don't think it's, I don't think it's out of the question at all. We see in, in Acts 8.4 that even persecution didn't stop Even persecution didn't stop the disciples from continuing to make more and more disciples. Because we see in Acts 8 that those who had been scattered were persecuted, uh, preached the word wherever they went. That was how the church was persecuted. They, They split them up and they sent them off into different corners of the area. But thinking that the church would die when you separated them. But what they did was in their area, they continued to make more and more disciples out of their new circle of influence, out of the, the new people in their lives. Um, so what happens when we, when we actually do this? What would happen if each and every one of us here committed to trying to make disciples in our everyday lives? Um, again, this is something that's really, really hard. This, this process of being a disciple and going and bearing witness to the resurrection, sharing your testimony and baptizing and continuing to teach and repeat. It's very, very hard, but it's really not that complicated. It's really, really simple. It's something that we, we are all capable of doing. And it's outlined pretty, pretty, clear, pretty clearly in Scripture. Um, but what happens when we do this is where I'm coming back to, to the title of the sermon of how to grow the church, how to stop mass shootings and solve all the world's problems in four simple, four simple steps because I really believe that making, the disciples, making disciples is the answer to all those questions. So let's start with growing the church. Um, we are all very excited to have Glenn Newton here and finally have a full-time preacher. And when he comes, we are all expecting growth. And I, too, am expecting growth. But what what I expect, what what is likely to happen, is just from Mandarin finally having a full-time preacher, just from that, we're going to get 20, 30 people who are already Christians looking for a church somewhere else. Because, because they like it here, and now we're finally getting everything together. Um, because the number one factor for Christians deciding what church to go to is the quality of preaching. That's the number one factor. In a survey, there was something like 80% of people said, this is the most important thing to me when picking out a church, is how good are the sermons. So we're going to get a lot of people coming here, I would guess, who are already Christians, and we're going to feel like we're growing. But to me, getting growth from, from transfers is not really growing the kingdom. It's just growing the number of people that happen to worship here on Sunday morning. In a sense, it's fake. It's artificial growth. Um, But what happens when we try and make disciples is we actually grow the whole church. We actually grow the kingdom by making new Christians. And what happens with new disciples is they just go with whoever is discipling them to church. They don't really care. Um, Jessica just started her job as a, as a fourth grade teacher. And so we, we sat down and we did some math, some basic math. And I said, what is, a, what is 100 times 2? And it turns out oh, that's 200. <laughs> so we have around 100 people here. Simple math, if everyone here made one disciple, we would double. Pretty simple, pretty basic. Um, I'm going to talk more about that specifically later. But I want to get into this stopping mass shootings thing? How, how would making disciples do any good when it comes to these shootings that keep popping up throughout our country? How would it, how would it stop any violence? And what, what I would suggest is that if the people committing these acts were disciples, were followers of Jesus, they probably wouldn't go into a building and shoot up a bunch of people. And now, Christians love when it... Whenever there's a mass shooting, they love to point out the fact, yep, that's another Muslim. That's another Muslim that did it. You know, if, it was, if he was a Christian, he wouldn't have done it, as if it somehow makes us look better. Because when I hear that, what I think is, yeah, you're right. A true follower, a true disciple would not have done that. Why didn't you make any effort to make that person into a disciple? When I see another mass shooting, my first reaction is, that's really sad, and I'm heartbroken. And my second reaction is, some church somewhere failed. 
and not making an effort to reach out and not making that person into a disciple. Not only do I believe that we can, we can another thing on mass shootings before, before I move on. When, when these things keep popping up over and over and over again, I, I often think any minute now, like any day now, there's going to be some sort of horrific incident in Jacksonville, Florida, where we live, because they keep happening. And it's only a matter of time before it happens here in our city and affects people that we know. And then my thought is, well, maybe what if the person that was going to do that became a disciple of Jesus? Maybe because of the work that this church and other churches in the area are doing, we've actually stopped one already. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know we could because I know if every person was a disciple of Jesus, a true, authentic learner, follower, and imitator, we wouldn't have that problem. I also believe that it would solve every problem in the world ever. And here, here's the logic, logic behind that. Someone once asked me to name the things in this world that I cared about the most, the problems with the world that I wanted to change the most. And I said some basic stuff, and he said, well, the best thing you can do to fix that problem is to go and make disciples of Jesus because Christians are the people who should be on the front line fighting against these issues. So today I want to know what it is that you really care about in the world. What is it wrong with the world that, that makes you mourn? What is it that, that really upsets you? Are you, are you upset? Are you, are you mourning? Are you tired of abortion? Then what I would say is go, therefore, and make disciples because disciples of Jesus take care of pregnant women and take care of their kids and make sure that we try and, and stop abortion from the bottom up, not from the top down. Are you frustrated? Are you tired of, of racism? Then go, therefore, and make disciples of Jesus because disciples of Jesus are not racist. Are you tired of poverty? Then go, therefore, and make disciples, because disciples of Jesus are on the front lines fighting against poverty. Are you tired of homelessness? Then go, therefore, and make disciples, because disciples of Jesus are fight, should be the ones fighting against homelessness. Are you tired of war? Are you tired of violence? Then go, therefore, and make disciples, because disciples of Jesus are peacemakers. Are you tired of hunger? Then go, therefore, and make disciples, because disciples of Jesus share their food with those in need. This is how we as Christians change the world, one soul for Jesus at a time. And I... I in this election season, I get really scared that we've, we've got it all wrong, that we think the way to change the world is from the top down, legislating morality, legislating Christia Christianity, putting policies in place that we think are going to make the world look more like Jesus wants it to look. And the reality is we've been trying this for years, and the state of our world is not any better. And it's not because of Democrats. And it's not because of Republicans. It's because the church isn't making disciples. That's, that's the problem. What, last time I preached, I talked about making Jesus the focus of everything you do and the center of your life and basing every decision you make around him. And it was much more broad. I'm going to be very, very pointed right now. If you think Jesus would try and change the world through political advocacy, through sharing memes uh, of politics on Facebook, then I honestly think that you're out of your mind. Because he's, there's nothing in Scripture that seems to suggest that when he was here, that's what he tried to do. What, what Jesus did, the way he changed the world, was he loved people and encouraged his followers to love people, and then he told them to go make more followers. We, as Christians, change the world from the bottom up, slowly but surely, by multiplying, by, by one person making a disciple, and then making another, and then that person makes a disciple. And then that person makes a disciple, and all of a sudden, the world is a different place because there are more people whose hearts are beating like Jesus. So let's start there. Let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Let's think about what our lives look like from the time we wake up to the time we go to the bed uh, on an average normal day. Who are the people you encounter? How many of them know Jesus? I, I'm willing to bet that each of us have one person in our lives that we could start discipling today if we wanted to. And so I don't know if you have any room left in, in your notes, 
I'm sure I'd talk too fast for anyone to take notes anyways. Um, but if, if you don't have room in your notes, you can do this somewhere else. But what I want us to do is, is be thinking, who is that one person in my square of influence? Who is someone I see on a regular basis that is not a Christian? And I want you to write that name in your bulletin. I don't see a lot of writing. Hopefully that's a lot of thinking. You don't have to do it now. You can do it later. But I want you to write the name of one person in your life that doesn't know Jesus that you can start discipling. And I want you to keep that bulletin. And if you can't think of anyone, I would suggest that you need to start with the going instead of the as you go so that you can surround yourself with more and more people who don't know Jesus so that you can actually have people in your life that you can impact. I am a minister. I work for the church, which means I don't go off to another job with a bunch of non-Christians um, that, I, that I can influence for the, for the kingdom, that I can win to Jesus. Most of my time is spent with people who are already Christians. But through outreach at Camry Green and through other, other events and through intentionally trying to, to meet people who don't know Jesus, I have plenty of people in my life too that I can start discipling. There's really no excuse to not have one person that you can make into a disciple. So write that down and I want you to keep it. Write down someone in your life that you know needs Jesus that you can make into a disciple. And here, here's what we're, we're going to try and do. Um, Tim Gallagher came up with this idea, and I think it's great. He, he suggested that on Glenn's first Sunday, which is, we don't know the exact date yet, do we? When Glenn's first Sunday is going to be? Sometime towards the end of October. He said, what if we could get 200 people here in this auditorium? Now, we've already done the math. We've already broke it down. 100 times 2 is 100. It's pretty simple, right? So there's no, what? Did I say it wrong? 100 times 2 is 200. That's why I need my wife. Um, the, math, the math is pretty simple. It's certainly realistic. So this person that you have written down in your bulletin, I want you to start this process of discipleship with them this week. I want you to start thinking about your relationship with them in terms of how I can make them a disciple. Start bearing witness to the resurrection with them. Um, you know, hopefully at some point baptize them, um, but, but maybe we'll get there later. And I want you to try and bring that person here to Mandarin whenever Glenn's first Sunday is, October 23rd or, or 30th, somewhere in that, in that time range. And we're going to see just how big of a difference we can make if we are all together trying to make disciples. Um, but again, I just want to close by saying the, the most important aspect of making a disciple is being a disciple yourself, and that's the place you have to start. I don't know how many of you would identify as a true, authentic follower, disciple of Jesus. Um, when, I, when I was listing the other things that we could be, Pharisee, social churchgoer, um, maybe even an atheist, there are all sorts of things we could be that, that aren't true disciples of Jesus. And if you would like to make that commitment today, this morning, to start the process of discipling others by becoming a disciple yourself. You can feel free to do that as we stand and as we sing. Thank you. Let's all stand. Have you been